I'm Jamie Vidassel, I'm a DevOps engineer at HelloSign, and I'm going to talk to you today about culture shock and small team agile. I call this an immigration talk because there is a big difference between traditional IT and small team agile, and software organizations are getting a net migration inbound from these traditional IT teams as the nature of traditional IT has changed. I myself have made this migration about five years ago. I failed at it, I got asshole rule fired, and I learned a heck of a lot. So this is what me trying to give back to the community to help you, help people like me integrate better into this software world that we have that is incredibly optimistic. But, but first, I wanted to talk about how some of the culture, what the, some of the cultural differences are and help build some em empathy about what the nature of traditional IT, if you've never worked in there, it looks like. Because traditional IT is an incredibly different thing here. We have, on one side, it's a service organization. It's quite simply, you do things for other parts of the organization at the direction of those other parts, and experts are charged with keeping things running, but have to ask to improve, to ask to they have to have any improvements approved. Whereas in the small team, an agile environment it is generative. It, it creates stuff, you create a product, continually make it better in collaboration with the entire group, product group experts working in a group to keep things running and continually improve them. These are very different viewpoints. Uh, there's a reason I drew a big gulf between those two, is because they're completely different viewpoints. And some of the extra ways that we can do that is uh, traditional IT organizations, as I list here, are different. They are extremely heterogeneous in supported technologies. And one group that I worked with previously, we had, one, during one audit, we had 250 different server instances supporting 125 different ind independent services. It's not one product we're keeping going, it's a whole handful of them, which makes for some differences in how you keep everything running. There's not as much commonalities there. Also, many different platforms, software frameworks, even databases you have to keep running. It is actually fairly common to have both Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, and MySQL running in some parts of the Oracle structure architecture at some point. And typically there's a lot of separation of duties there too. You have your discrete system in department, your development team may or may not even be in the IT service organization. If they truly are old school, it may be this department way over there that we never actually talk to. And the database administrators are off in their own corner and the network people are in a basement that you never talk to, even though it's their fault most of the time, but not really. And it's also very mixed ownership. Again, going back to that 125 services thing, only a small handful of those are fully owned by the IT organization. Things like the email system were. Other things that were supporting individual department applications, well, some of it was ours. Perhaps we maintained the server, but they maintained everything above the server, or except sometimes they didn't. And it makes for very unclear ownership about who's responsible for which parts of things. And these organizations habitually end up being very bureaucratic, and path, sometimes pathologic and organizational culture, rarely generative. Uh, to unpack some of those terms, a bureaucratic culture is rules-based. The whole point of that is to follow the rules. Innovation in there is definitely possible in there, but it has to follow this rigid step of processes and approvals to actually get approved. In pathologic organizations, it's all power-based. If you've ever had that manager who is completely controlling and nothing got done unless it, whatever you were doing was supporting them, that's what a pathological organization is. So uh, the only, these sorts of organizations aren't very, aren't very amenable to large parts of creativity, but especially in pathologic, the only way you get anything approved is if it supports the local boss in what they're doing. That is the only way you'll get any change approved. If it doesn't, it'll be squashed completely. And unfortunately, this means there are different ways of maintaining psychological safety because there is a Google report out about a couple months ago that talked a lot about effective teams. And some of you may have read it. And one of the things that they found out at the end of the report was that the one thing that makes an effect, a team effective is if all the members of that team feel psychologically safe. And the other thing they discovered in that is that there is no one technique or process tree that will make a team effective by imposing it from within. Teams come to their own methods of psychological safety independently. When you're facing this sort of hostile environment, 
you come up with different methods of maintaining psychological safety than you would on, say, the generative software agile side. And that's the kind of the key of what I'm talking about here is that the, those of us who've made the migration are coming from a different place of what it is acceptable in the environment and what I have to do to keep my mind safe. And well, that's what it's here. And the final thing about this one, about service based or architectures for people, is that Americans are absolute crap at treating our service workers with respect. Even those of us who have been highly trained and been entrusted with very large environments to keep running, we're still treated like crap, taken for granted. And the other thing Americans are great at is feeling entitled. I'm highly trained. I have a right to be at the table. And yet these architectures are designed to make sure that those of us who are the service providers just have to say, yes, we will do that even though we're privately thinking this is a very bad idea and I wish you hadn't done that, but we have to do this anyway because the person who's telling us what to do tells us what to do. And frankly, little makes for a toxic environment faster than being a highly trained with professional standards and no one listens to you. It's microaggressions. Oh my goodness, the microaggressions. Because the thing is, it comes from all sides. <laughs> and. This is the, one of the points I do want to bring up here is that there's another difference between traditional IT and generative organizations. Traditional IT is very much focused on keeping things up in spite of everything. And generative organizations are about making things better. This is a pessimistic point of view and an optimistic point of view. When you bring them together, you get culture conflicts. And it doesn't get better. But some of, along in the microaggressions, because it does really come from all sides. For those of us doing direct IT and supporting our direct users or everything else, there's a whole cloud of things that come and just sort of make our lives not happy. Malware, that happy thing that comes in and hoses up people's machines and make us lose hours as we have to reformat them. Mr. Helpful, usually a mister, who takes it upon themselves to help optimize their fellow users' workstations to be faster and better because central IT doesn't know what they're doing, or perhaps maybe take out some of those bits that central IT wants in there because they're looking after you, man. We don't like Mr. Helpful because he does, makes more work for us, and that's bad. And unauthorized VPNs. Those firewall rules are there for a reason. Bypassing them with an unauthorized VPN is sometimes grounds for termination, and we really don't want to make that decision, but yes, we will have to talk to you if that's the case. DMCA notices, please do not BitTorrent from the company network. Because most companies are not set up to deal with this sort of thing and it raises a huge panic when someone says, yeah, some DVD was caught from the company IP address. So this is less of a problem now because home, I, home internet is typically faster than what you get in the office. This wasn't always the case. But it still happens from time to time. And our least favorite thing, porn collections. Because when you're reformatting a machine because of malware, one of the nice customer service things you can do is take the user's data off of the hard drive you're about to nuke, do your thing, and put the data back on. Both Windows and Mac make this fairly easy now. It's taken some time. But when you're doing that migration, you see this stream of porn going by. It makes for a hostile work environment. So, and it's not just from the people that we're servicing. It also comes from the sides because one of the unwritten rules about systems administration and ops stuff is while there may be standards, and we all think we have professional standards about how things are supposed to be done, there is no standard setting body outside of ISIL saying this is how it shall be done, and these are the standards to which the entire industry shall be held accountable, which means that it's up to local definition. Unfortunately, that means that me and my little department with my coworkers we think the other department over there, on the other side of the screen, are doing it wrong because they're incompetent bozos because they, they, they make some decisions and they interpret the, the general standards in ways that we don't agree with. So we think they're incompetent bozos and they think the same of us because that's kind of how it works. Now, I'll take it back a minute and talk about our porn collection and the reformatting of hard drives one more time. What if instead of a porn collection, that particular laptop I had been to been to that particular user five times in the last month. Because that particular user, have, we haven't found a way to break a certain feedback loop to go to certain sites that host Mac-based malware, and this particular user can't help but keep clicking on it. So we have to keep going back to that station, rebuilding it for them. 
and giving it back to them, knowing I'll be back within a week. But here's the kicker. What if that workstation was not my user? What if it was in the department of that other Bozo department over there? And the reason I was doing that machine is because I have the literacy to deal with Mac-based re-imaging, and the Windows bigots over there, because they're incompetent Bozos, won't touch the thing. But the reason I'm over there at all is because I need to keep those people happy in the coordination meetings. So we've got this little microaggression coming in this way. I'm, I'm doing something I don't particularly find, I don't particularly like, because I have to keep people I don't particularly like happy, because I need them happy in the meetings in which I need to get things approved. But it doesn't stop there. As I said, it comes from all sides. Willful ignorance from on high. You know? Oh, great gods of budget, please hear my prayer. We have a malware problem. It is costing us about $100,000 a month, $100,000 a year in lost staff time to reformat these drives. For the low price of $15,000 a year, we can cut the problem by 90%. Please, may we have the money. And there's deliberation and three months of lag, and they come back with, Macintosh is 20% of our fleet. That is not worth that level of investment. Request denied. <sighs> but so how can you survive this sea of hostility? And that, that works with an island of sanity, because I have a team of awesome here. And as soon as it'll go, yes, I have a team of awesome. My coworkers, they know what they're doing. We know what they're doing, and they have my back. I have their back. When I come back from having to reimage that laptop the fifth time, I sit down and say, OK, five times. And the other person in the chair goes, yeah, well, this is another time that starts sharing stories. And we feel a little bit better about our lives because we're awesome. We are the thin line between the duct tape infrastructure and the chaos monkeys that will wreck it. Because, like I said before, a lot of what we do is, well, it seems like a lot of what we do is keep the infrastructure running in spite of itself. But it's still this team of awesome that makes it work. Now, this also leads to several methods of psychological safety in addition to having your island of sanity. And the next one here, and this, I put this one as number one for a very good reason. Reflexive change resistance. Fear of change not initiated by me or my team of awesome because it's not initiated by me or my team of awesome, it's coming from that sea of hostility around me. It's probably going to be badly implemented, and it is probably going to make our stability problem worse. So how you deal with this when you're not empowered to actually be in the decision loop at the time of how shall we solve this problem, but at the end, when, they're, when you're given this product, someone walks up to the teller window and say, hi, we just bought this software for $30,000 here, and you have $40,000 to buy hardware. We need it in uh, three weeks, uh, three months. Go. That's not how it works. Uh, how it almost always works is we look at this. We go, this software is crap. Anybody who knows this particular problem knows that this is an unmaintainable piece of crap. Why did this get approved? This is bad. And it goes on from there. It's all this pushback by pitching a fit. Sometimes you can make positive change. So yes, this software purchase is somewhat fait accompli, but as we all know, well, those of us who've worked in purchasing large contracts, there's always a little wiggle room in who, who bought what when and what sort of horse trading you can do to change options at the last minute, even if it isn't a different amount of money. And sometimes you can maybe swap some options in to make it slightly more maintainable and slightly less likely to make everybody's hair go away in frustration and perhaps maybe involve us in the process earlier next time. We're perfectly willing to help involve us, please. But sometimes that doesn't work. And that leads to intentional deinvestment. So we do all this thing to try to do the horse trading thing. And they come back and says, tough. I want it. Do it anyway. And this is the point when <laughs> intentionally deinvestment. I no longer care how this turns out. It is not worth my sanity to worry about how this ill-advised piece of software is going to be installed and how it's going to be maintained. To save my sanity, I no longer care. This leads to a decrease in service levels in the end because you're t by doing this, you purposely take away the professionalism on the software. So it actually is going to be harder to maintain in the long run because of this. But the people are doing this as a way to maintain sanity within. It's a symptom of a broken culture, but unfortunately, some of us, so much of us have lived through this one. And the next one, compartmentalization. Getting steamroll, I, the DBAs over there, whom we don't talk to because 
their DBAs and where, where it's technically separated, they just got told, hi, we're changing out all of our Oracle stuff and move it to all Postgres. Meanwhile, they're up doing this, throwing chairs around, and we're, we all, all we really will do is like, there, there, hug, pat, 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 stroke, stroke, squeeze. It'll be better, and walk off. We won't actually help the problem because we don't borrow troubles we don't already have because we have enough of our own. It's compartmentalization. And in, for example, if that department of the bozos over there who don't know what they're doing have a similar problem, we'll sympathize with the meetings, but we won't actually offer help because, again, we have enough on our own plate. Compartmentalization. And the third one, and the fourth one, bonding through negativity because pain shared is pain divided. I gave a little example of that earlier when I got back from re-imaging that laptop, sat down, and my coworker shared a story of their own problems. You see this kind of thing happen all the time in IT organizations and other areas as well. But it also leads to a certain type of humor. And here's a few tweets that show kind of what I'm talking about. These are the fairly kind ones. And it all shares a certain theme. It kind of goes back to that tweet I showed earlier. Everything is, everything is on fire, including me, and this is OK. You'll see a certain theme. I mean, this is very common. There's a lot of Twitter out there for, if you want to follow this kind of thing, this is really crack. So it was kind of fun to actually gather this list. <laughs> but the thing is, it's not just IT types. Police departments, firefighters, ER professionals, animal control officers all deal with the same kind of thing in some way. It's dealing with humanity and all of its ill-advisedness. Police officers, you did what to your wife? And the firefighters, you set what on fire? ER professionals, you cut what off? And the animal control officers, you did what to the dog? Now, the animal control officers are some of the most humane people I know, simply because they deal with such amazing cruelty on a daily basis. But when you get all four of these people together in their own groups, and I've hung out with all four at various parts of my life, how they bond amongst themselves is extremely familiar to those of us who've lived in IT-based service organizations. It's that sort of handshake of, yeah, I know everything sucks, but we're together. I have similar shared experience. It's not just you alone. It's that sort of mutual support society that comes in. And it's not always healthy, especially in IT. Uh, so one of the ways we do that is the stupid user story. It's, it goes back. Back to the 70s, frankly, the various weird things that users do, we swap stories and scrub the names off, but we're still laughing at the stupid. It's not very healthy, but it's, again, what, kind of what's done. So here we are at the end, and how are we going to get out of this? Because this is, a circle of, this is a circle of woe. And as I mentioned before, the market's changed, and we're getting migration. And what did it with software as a service? 10 to 15 years ago, traditional IT was a lot like what I described earlier. Someone coming up to the teller window with a big hunk of software and a big bank check saying, buy a bunch of hardware, that we didn't have to spec out, order, actually figure out how much we need of the right kind, work with vendors, install it, integrate it into our whole lot of systems and a whole bunch of other stuff. These days, it's far easier. Someone comes up to the teller window and says, I've just spent $30,000 for a software as a service application. I don't need any software. I don't need any hardware purchase. I just need to figure out how to put a single sign-on system in front of it and how to map the data flows into our other systems. In other words, you're managing data flows at this point and trying to front-end a, a web service with a single service framework. It's web development, frankly, and a, lot of, and a lot of data manipulation. That's code. And it starts making people think. Because if you've been working on code for the last five years, writing scripts and things to do database translations and writing scripts to do ETL processes and a bunch of other stuff, you think, you know, I actually know some of this code stuff. And we actually have some Jenkins things around here. I've helped some of our other our developers work through some issues. I, I'm actually maintaining a Git server now. And why do I have to stay here? What if I move to one of these SaaS companies and have only one single product to maintain? One, not 125. One product that I can focus fully on and make awesome. Leave, a, leave, a, leave behind me this toxic cesspit of disrespect and things I hate and move off to this wonderland of promise of not hating my job. And so we go out, we job hunt, we post a resume, we make sure we mention all the DevOpsy things we've done because we see the industry rags too. And we go the interviews and, you know, have you spent many time in uh, 
a, psych, a pathological environment, so you know how to manage an in-person interview, so you pass that with flying colors and you get a new job. Yay! New job! We are leaving this cesspit that we hate, and we now have a new thing, and wow, is it different. Because the first day of the job, you have your nice fancy workstation, and you spend a day or two, and spend a day setting up your dev workstation, and you may do your commit on the first day, which is useful to do because it teaches you how the commit process works in a, in a given environment, which you're going to need to do. And there's a whole lot of learning that has to happen because software organizations function very differently than what traditional IT is. But this was done intentionally. I was leaving behind this. I'm purposely embracing this new world. And for the first few weeks, it's all learning. We're, we're quiet and we're just picking things up, increasing our comfort with our fellow coworkers, and at some point, it will happen. Someone will mention a fairly big change. I think it's time to replace our Redis environment with a Kafka cluster because we're gonna need the, the, the scalability requirements. And this is when the problem starts because this is a developer proposing this. This is someone who doesn't have the ops background. Historically, this has been in the circle of bozos around the island of safety, so this is what happens. What, no, can't do this, we don't know how. Now here's a key thing, because this type of proposal, will, the kind of thing that would likely come up during a sprint planning meeting or possibly during a stand-up, kind of depends on the local culture of what, what particular company is. But if you look at how these, these particular organizations work and these particular meetings work, it's a lot more free flow. Uh, what do you think about this? We should do this or not? And it's very back and forth and it's very collaborative and very dynamic. And here's somebody saying, wait, stop, 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 stop. We can't do this. It stops everything cold. And there's a couple of ways to do this one. And the healthy way to do that one is to actually challenge it. Okay, so the scrum leader, whoever says, what challenges are you seeing? Okay, okay, we can make some user stories about that. Can you work with the person who proposed it? And we can put together a list and probably flesh out these user stories so we can appropriately size this particular epic because he knows it's gonna be an epic. And away you go. That's how it's supposed to happen. All too often when someone says no that flatly, what happens is, is people stare at the person who just did the very strange thing, quietly ignore it, and the scrum master or whoever says, okay, looks like we're not ready for that now. Let's you and me talk after the meeting, and okay, well, what about your update? And then quietly drop it. Meanwhile, after the meeting, they talk, we start building things, and these two work out the issues that are the operations problems that probably cause a new person to throw, throw a big monkey wrench into things. And come the next sprint meeting or sprint planning meeting, and it's still on the agenda, the person who got cut out is going to go, okay, they're not listening to me anymore. All right, I know how to handle that. The investment. They just sort of shut up. Now, this is the challenging part of managing an agile team with some, one of these digital immigrants. Because if someone said no so forcefully in the planning meeting and suddenly shuts up and doesn't input into the process at all, that's actually a bad signal. Negative signals like that are hard to interpret, so pay attention to them. And the way you deal with this one is to actually sit down with them. Okay, I see you had some big problems with this when you initially proposed it, but I haven't heard anything from since. What kind of problems are you seeing now? And you're gonna get, you're gonna, you're gonna get told because these are people who are not used to being asked their opinion. And when they do, they typically do it fairly voluminously because it's been building up for a while. The whole thing here is to start retraining these people in that you can contribute. You don't have to wait back and sort of throw these verbal elbows in. You can actually just say, you know, I think this is not, I don't think we have this fully fleshed out yet. The ultimate goal is when someone brings up a big problem like this, a big task like this one is, is I can see a lot of operation side effects of that one. I'd be happy to work with you and flesh out those user stories and actually volunteer that at the front instead of having to have it drawn out of them by the scrum master or whoever's leading the meeting. But you have to get them to that point. And it can take a couple of years to get this sort of deep history of trauma behind them and actually get them comfortable with the way the social dynamics work in an agile system. It can happen. And bonding through negativity. Now this one would actually happen before the big problem. This is when someone who's been in this IT organization, this completely dysfunctional type stuff, tries to make friends with the fellow coworkers. Everybody loves a good use, stupid user story. I got lots. And starts bagging on our users, bagging on our managers, and bagging on the other ops, dev teams if there is one.
because under the, under the misconception that that's how teams like ours work. That's not how we work. When you're in a large product group, uh, I have yet to meet the product manager who likes that sort of combativeness between each development groups, and especially with, with a negative attitude towards our users. No, you don't want that. You're trying to build a, it's optimistic and focus. So yes, we're trying to support our users. This is a attitude we're trying to focus. And you really do need to check that. Check it. Signpost to your office culture. This sort of negativity is not acceptable. And I say even you upper Midwesterners, because I grew up in Minnesota. And the way this sort of problem is handled is sort of quietly nod and smile and never talk to that person again. And they just sort of slowly shun, and you walk away, and you never actually talk to them again. And they may not even notice they're being cut out, especially if they're coming from another part of the country where that sort of language isn't really understood. But this is something that, if you're not comfortable with conflict, this is one of those things where you really need to actually get up and do it. Stop that. It's not acceptable. This is the thing that you may actually have to figure out the real assholes that are coming in through the hiring pipeline. Because a true asshole, when you check them on that, or either fire, return fire with further hostility and double down, that's a true asshole, fire that person, they're an asshole, get rid of them. But the adapted assholes, the ones who figured out this is how you talk in the workplace, but fundamentally are nice people, will start dialing it down and start adapting to the environment they now find themselves in. Because you've given them a hard jerk on the job, on the leash on their job, saying, hi, if you keep doing this, you'll not have this job anymore. If they respond to that particular in, in, input, you have someone you can work with. So, and the next thing I want to talk about here is my summary slide. That got quick. So, uh, three, three things you want to do, and this is the one slide you want to take a screenshot of, this is the one you want to do, because there's three things to do when you're dealing with these digital migrants. And the first one is to redirect them. You want to turn that reflexive negativity into an option to provide feedback. And what this does is it teaches that they can provide feedback safely without having to use excessive verbal elbow and discommoding all the other people in the, entire, in the room. And the second thing is to make sure to re-engage them. Because these are people who are, especially if they're the lone ops person in a dev team, they're already used to working by themselves. And it may take repeated attempts to bring them back over and communicating and integration, and it may require having to explicitly pair them with a developer, like that Kafka thing I was talking about earlier. Okay, I need you, the, ops, the ex ops person, and you, the developer, propose it to sit down together for a week or whatever and work together some of the issues of what this deployment would look like and start getting them integrated and instead of just being off a, a service island by themselves. So what you're teaching them is that they are a person they are not a service, they are a person. This can be amazingly hard to pound out of some heads. It took a while for me. And then, of course, stop the hurtful negativity because IT people can be cynical bastards. And it's not always the happy cynical, it's sometimes the hurtful negative kind. You need to very clearly signpost that that is not acceptable. Check that shit and fire the assholes who don't adapt. And that's. That's time we need to come to questions. So if you have any questions about office culture, if not, I can start going on about the Google study. So any problems you've had in scrum meetings that you may want to help some sociological advice on? All right. Now, one thing I do want to talk about here, see if I can, will it do it? Yes, awesome. So there was a slide this morning. Let's see if I can make it do the thing. Oh, you're not going to do that. All right, so we'll have to be there. I'll turn you off. You over here. This was a slide that came up this morning uh, from Catherine Daniels at the keynote she gave for Continuous Lifecycle London. Now, this one slide, again, this was delivered this morning by someone who was not me. It was part of a larger discussion about effective DevOps culture, and I want to Look at this one specifically, because the Google study that I mentioned earlier, it went through a lot of iterations before they finally figured out what's going on. And their first try was to, like engineers, drill down to the very bottom essence of what it is to be an effective team. What is the one thing that they all have? 
figure out what it is, impose it from without on the non-effective teams, and make them effective teams. And they couldn't find it. There is no tool. There is no pro one process that will do that. What they found, ultimately, is that there are tools and processes that are conducive to maybe fostering this environment in most cases, which is not the case, which is not the absolutist thing they were looking for. What they had to do is they had to go up a couple of levels on the stack out of the tools and processes layer into the people layer, because people are delightfully analog. Very analog, in fact. You can't just teach them as digital units that get slotted into buckets. And it ended up being psychological safety. So was the thing that actually made things work. And for some, some groups, it very much is. Eight people sitting at a table, throwing ideas at each other, ripping them to shreds as they come across. And this the robust exchange of ideas that can be completely vicious works for them. And everybody at that table is perfectly happy with that sort of thing. And they're a very effective team until someone new has to come in and integrate with it, in which case it may not work so well because they don't deal well with being eviscerated by their new coworkers, but you know, sometimes it works. And other groups, such as those Minnesotans I was talking about, where that sort of robust exchange of ideas is eight people staring in a room. Someone throws out, I think maybe you should do that. There's three or four seconds of silence. Someone says, how about if we do this other thing instead? And slowly and carefully, they work through this problem just because of the communication styles of different regions actually work. So when you're looking at your agile, agile teams, the planning meetings, the stand-ups, be aware of this. You're looking for psychological safety, ultimately. And the problems that I've identified are very much ways to help ease someone into the software engineering type of optimistic environment. Scrub off the cynicism, or at least repress it into helpful ways, and actually help contribute. You are not a, you are not a service. You are a person. Please talk to us. We like hearing from you. You have good ideas. So, any other questions? Oh, that got done fast. All right. In that case, I don't have anything else to say. So I guess you get to go to break early. Hopefully, get the snacks fast. So, thank you.